everyone. My name is Daniela Raposo. I'm the director of the Columbia Startup Lab. Uh, we're so excited to have you here for our second ever CSL Talks. Those who don't know, the CSL Talks is a series that we started that is essentially the TED Talks for uh, the entrepreneurship ecosystem at Columbia. So we have so, so, so many amazing entrepreneurs um, that are thought leaders across industry. And we realized why not give them a platform and space to be able to talk to you guys about what they're expert in and talk to you guys about their entrepreneurial journey um, and pay it forward a little bit to the Columbia community. We are so excited to have a current CSL member, Alon, who is the founder of FOAR. He is here to do a talk on how AR and VR can change the world. He is an alum of uh, the School of Engineering. And fun fact, he started the company with his brother, Karen, who is an alumni of the law school. Uh, so there is so much Columbia within that family. We're so excited to have them. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Alon to get started. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for Columbia Entrepreneurship and Columbia Startup Lab for inviting me. And thank you all for attending. Hopefully, we're going to have a really cool conversation today about the past, present, and future of technology. I'm going to share my screen uh, and we're going to dive right in. So today we're going to talk about how augmented and virtual reality can change the world. I'll start by saying hello. I'm Alon Grinchburn. I'm an alum of Columbia Engineering, graduated in 2018. I did my master's in computer science, but specifically specializing in augmented reality, virtual reality, and human-computer interaction. And did my undergrad in computer science and electrical engineering. So obviously a certified nerd and a big believer in the space of augmented and virtual reality. The company that I run is called Echo AR. Uh, as Daniela mentioned, we're members of the CSL community. We provide tools and network infrastructure for developers and companies who want to build AR, VR, 3D applications. Um, I'm going to tell you more about us, but we basically raised over a million dollars so far. Uh, all of our team is based in New York, and the CSL has been an amazing, amazing supporter of us for a long time now. We've, as I mentioned, supported, uh, we went through Techstars, Y Combinator, got grants from uh, Verizon, and recently raised our seed round uh, with uh, Reimagined Ventures. We won a bunch of awards. Uh, we were there for every major tech conference when tech conferences were a thing. Um, so if at any point in the future you're at one of these tech conferences, try to find our team and say hello. Um, happy to answer at the end about questions about augmented reality, virtual reality, but also about our journey and maybe uh, stuff around entrepreneurship and how to raise funds and stuff like that. We'll love to share that with the community. So let's level set a little bit. Um, I'm going to use these terms a lot, VR, AR. So let's just make sure that everyone's on the same page here. Virtual reality or VR is when everything around you is digital. You're fully immersed in a digital environment and everything you see is a digital construct. Um, so it's basically CGI, some computer generated imagery that's being projected into your eyes through a headset that occludes your vision, sometimes adds some sensory uh, data like uh, some music or sound, stuff like that. Um, but you're fully immersed in, 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 in completely fake environment as opposed to augmented reality or AR in which we basically still see the real world, but we overlay that world with digital content. So we add data to that world um, and you're looking through the world either through a camera see-through like a phone or a tablet uh, or through an optical see-through like some smart glasses or um, this headset that you can see right here. A really cool concept to understand is through the amazing movie, Space Jam. So if you haven't seen it, it's amazing. Go watch it. Um, here we have an example of how Michael Jordan is being teleported into Looney Town. Everything around him is a cartoon, is able, able to interact with bugs and all the Looney Tunes through what we um, understand as virtual reality. And later in the movie, we have a great example of augmented reality in which we have the Looney Tunes coming to us. We're able to play around, uh, to play around with them. Uh, they're playing basketball in the real court, on the real court with Bill Murray. Um, so these are, again, the differentiations between VR and AR. Either we are going to Looney Town or Looney Town is coming to us. Real world examples of that is something that you're mostly uh, probably familiar with, like uh, Pokemon Go, when people run around playing around digital monsters that are not actually there or this really cool VR uh, game called Beat Saber, where you slash cubes based on the rhythm of the music, but you're fully immersed in a digital environment. Everything around you is just CGI. Another cool example of this is my thesis project back at Columbia University. So um, we took CT and MRI, converted them into um, 3D models, 
put them on these smart glasses called HoloLens, which we'll talk about later. It basically allowed the physician to get the inside view of the patient. Um, we did that project with the basically my uh, lab back at Columbia and uh, Columbia Medical, the, 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 um, the medical school, and that was an insane experience. I would walk in into surgery, fully scrubbed in, give the smart glasses to a physician, and they will start drilling on a patient that was sitting on the table. It was an insane experience, but that was a really cool example of augmented reality and how you can basically revolutionize a space like medicine with this new type of content, allowing the physician to see the inside of the patient in real time and guiding a catheter through their body by getting this 3D reference map of the patient's anatomy. The problem was that in order to do that, I had to physically do that development cycle and change it, the 3D models. So basically take those CT and MRI, convert them into 3D. And I had to do something I really, really hate, and that's waking up early in the morning. I had to be at the hospital at like 6 a.m., swap out 3D models, make a heart into an aorta, into a lung. And that took so much time. And as a developer, I only wanted to do two things, right? Just to manage 3D assets and deliver them to an air device. Our team started talking to other developers who've built augmented reality applications for retail and shopping inner navigation and more, they all said the same thing, that there's no easy way to manage and deliver 3D data. But if you think about it, this problem is already solved for what we call 2D data, like images and videos. Um, companies like Heroku gave you a way to upload a website without, without a lot of technical skills. Same happened to mobile five years ago. So we had web, then mobile, now we're talking about this new age of technology, this new type of content instead of 2D to 3D, and you call it AR, VR, immersive, 3D, MR, whatever. Um, question I have to be asked, who's gonna build that um, infrastructure? And you've guessed that that's us. So this is basically what we do. We provide tools and network infrastructure to, for developers to build 3D applications at scale. And in a sec, we'll see how we can do that. And uh, this part will be actually really interactive because I want you all to play around in AR right now while we're doing the workshop. And we'll see that in a sec. So backing up a little bit, so how does that work? So the same way you don't need to be a web developer to update a blog post, you can drag and drop an image or video, suddenly that appears in web and mobile. Or if we're both watching, let's say Narcos on Netflix, we automatically get the best streaming experience. In augmented and virtual reality, we translated these concepts so we will be able to match 3D targets in the real world with 3D content and get the best 3D streaming experience. Basically, this is what we've built and in a sec, I'll show you how that works. So let's start with a very interactive part of augmented reality that I want you to all experience it right now. Um, so this is our product. I'm gonna um, upload some fan favorite 3D model of the Empire State um, because New York and CSL and Columbia. So let's do that. Let's throw that into our console. It's gonna basically upload to our cloud. And after that is done, I'll be able to stream that data to everyone's phone right now. So what I want you to all do is just scan this QR code right now. So just use your phone. I'm gonna do the same. Most phones already have like a built-in QR code. So just uh, point your phone in front of it. It will redirect it to your website. You don't have to install anything. Uh, and you'll automatically be able to see the Empire State in your room right now. So all you have to do is scan this QR code. I'm gonna place it right here, C in AR, and there you go. We have the Empire State Building right here. I'm gonna put it on the table, and there you go. We have it right here, and able to rock around it, walk inside, super, super simple, able to rotate it. Very cool, try it right now with your phones. Um, it's a pretty shocking experience to see the outside in these times of uh, social distancing and being quarantined. It's only seeing um, the New York monuments in your house. So all I have to do is just scan it and, and, and press uh, CNAR, super simple. Um, and also another cool thing that you can do is actually have videos and uh, images in augmented reality. So let's see how that works. I'm gonna keep this here for a sec. Um, I'm gonna upload a fan favorite um, video of a really, really cool song that I really like. Let's put that up. Again, same process, we're just like uploading that 3D, like that 3D content to the cloud. This time it's just a video. And now I want you all to see a video in AR um, that could basically use for anything. And later we're gonna talk about use case of augmented virtual reality. So you have the most amazing um, video clip of all times. Scan this QR code again if you want. Again, just point your camera to it. Super, super easy. Uh, if your camera's um, not the latest version, you can always use a QR code. And basically, we'll see this really cool um, video. Let's see that. Hey, my phone's a little. Whoop. There we go. 
scan that again. And you can scan it with me, as I mentioned, and that will just redirect you to website that will show you um, just a music video. So let's see that. There we go. Perfect. So it's 10 points to whoever recognizes this song. Um, but this is a quick way to basically overlay data that is not actually there on the real world, similar to what we see in Pokemon Go. Perfect. Um, you can do the same thing, uh, for example, one example, and we'll talk about use cases later uh, of augmented reality, virtual reality, but you can add really magical things. Let's say you want to have a video of how to wash your hands. I'm going to upload something like that. Um, let's do that. And then basically overlay that with a QR code. Everyone who scans that is able to see in a structural video on how to wash their hands like really, really easily. Um, we allow you to do that again for videos or so 3D models, uh, animations, interactive content. And the point is, again, like bringing people into this new medium. If you think about it, 10 years ago, people will ask, what do you need a website for? And five years ago, people will ask, what do you need an app for? And now when it comes to technology, it's obvious that every bakery and every government organization needs a website. Lady Gaga has an app. So when you're building a, a, a service or you're building a venture, think about how you can inject these new types of technologies and how you can integrate new types of content to facilitate really engaging interaction that obviously has an insane wow factor. So now that we know a little bit how, uh, what AR and VR are, now that we've seen AR together, uh, let's do some history lesson about the history of augmented and virtual reality, how they came about, um, and they either talk about use cases and um, the, the way this technology is revolutionizing the world today. So it all started in 1838, a while back with the stereoscope, basically a contraption that some of you might have actually seen at, at some capacity that basically projects two different images to your eyes. At the end, I'm going to tell you a secret. Augmented virtual reality, all they do is just trick your brain. We basically do, we send different images to each eye. And this, this means that basically your brain thinks that there's depth, right? It gives the illusion of 3D. Um, I see Paul saying that you lost. No worries, I'm going to return to the scans again later and you'll be able to scan it again. No worries. Um, so after we had the stereoscope, again, the first um, basic demo of 3D and basically the first demo of how you can get the sense of depth that is not actually there, um, we had years after the kinetoscope, an insane construction that looks almost like the size of a fridge that basically allowed, again, the viewer to trick their brain with a stream of video that projected something that seemed like 3D, faking the, the, the illusion of depth through projecting two different images to each eye. Years after um, the first VR use case starts to emerge, and that's simulation, people are trying to simulate, for example, here, uh, we're trying to do a flight simulator, basically trying to figure out how to make pilots train in virtual reality without actually needing to have a plane or stuff like that. Um, this is a really cool uh, story. This is the first time in pop culture that AR glasses were a thing. 1935, uh, Pygmalion Spectacles were these eyeglasses that were able to enhance your senses and give you a sense of something that you don't see. Uh, this is a fantastic use case of what now we call augmented reality. Jumping forward a little bit, the Viewmaster, this is something that probably some of you have seen or you can actually buy uh, and like target some like uh, cheap version of it. But again, same concept, just tricking your brain that you're going to get um, two different images and, um, and basically get that sense of 3D. After that, there was another attempt. Again, you can see like these machines are really bulky as opposed to what we have today. Um, but there was like a really good estimation. If you think about it, this was like years ago. And, and, and this looks still looks a little bit science fiction. -y. Moving forward in time, we had the head site, which was the first motion um, tracking um, heads, head mounted display. So basically, understanding where the user is. And you can see that the guy here is actually wearing a tux because they thought that this will be a high-end um, enterprise solution that people will actually use uh, to simulate environments. Obviously, we understand that this is not acceptable um, um, as a solution, but look how far we've come. But like already in 1961, we had a way to track people in 3D space using magnets. Jumping forward and trying to commercialize VR, we had the Sensorama. That was like an insane machine, uh, usually for arcades, in which you would sit. And it would simulate what, what it was like to basically drive a motorcycle around New York. And it had 
everything. So sight, sounds, vibrations, um, smell of hot dogs and exhaust pipes uh, to basically literally um, simulate that experience of driving uh, a motorcycle. It was a complete failure because obviously who wants to use it? Uh, but at, the, uh, at that time, which again was 62, people really thought that this could be the next thing of uh, stimulating people's senses. Jumping forward in time, this is a really cool contraption. And there's one very similar at Columbia uh, that basically was the, the first head mounted display, again, using the same concept that we already talked about, projecting two different uh, images to your eye. But this thing was so heavy, it actually had to pr um, be suspended from the ceiling using pipes. And this is obviously not consumer ready. But this was like a really, really cool um, um, device that was the basis for every human computer, uh, human computer interaction that came after. Jumping forward, we have another attempt of commercializing uh, VR. Um, now we introduce a very cool concept called field of view, basically how the projection of these virtual images uh, looks and how they're being used. Um, so if you have a, like a human field of view is almost like 180, a little more, like you can like literally see your sides, that's not the case in old tech and in old VR, that you're basically being either looking uh, through a box or looking at a segment of reality. Um, so that was a really cool advancement with that. Now we're seeing some really cool research that's been done about, um, again, human computer interaction and gestures. Suddenly we're figuring out that when we talk about um, mobile or web, like it's really understandable to use a mouse or a keyboard, but how do you interact with things in 3D? So um, this video place project basically allowed you to interact with um, objects using your hands. One of the first uh, hand gesture um, project that, and research projects that basically allowed us to understand, okay, the hands could be the tool for us to interact with the world, which is obviously obvious in the non-computer science um, domain. NASA really tried to push things forward with their, um, with their headset, introducing a really cool retro looking device that was one of the first VR headsets ever. Um, and like, this is not that long ago, like 85. You're gonna see that we're gonna rapidly accelerate to um, full on AR glasses really soon. But this was not that long ago. Like think about how the world has changed so quickly with these devices. Uh, so here we had an example of a really cool VR headset, but it also introduced uh, VR haptic gloves. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about future technologies. Um, but basically allowed you to almost like a ready player one kind of thing, play around with digital uh, object with your hands. This was a very comical um, use case, again, doing a flight simulator uh, in the US Air Force. Um, I'm sure no one wants to actually wear this on their head, but this will allow them to create, again, that full sense of immersion. The British actually did it much better than the Americans. You can see that this looks much more, um, um, let's say, refined. They had both AR and VR headsets that allowed um, test pilots to play around in a virtual environment and get a sense that they're in the sky. Right after that, we finally get to 87. This is the first time that actually the world virtual reality was coined. Um, unbelievable that these terms were literally um, not that long ago. Same thing with augmented reality. Only in 1990, we got the word augmented reality, and now everyone's using it. 91 was the first time that people tried to gamify VR. And basically, there's this cool thing called virtuality that was like an arcade game with controllers. Again, now instead of using your hands, you're using controllers, borrowing from the games and joysticks, the thing that people really uh, recognize. And uh, they did like this location-based arcade, uh, mostly in the UK, and that was a complete failure. But they tried and again, paved the way for more immersive experiences and understanding how these new technologies can be effective in gaming, which is another use case that we're gonna talk about later. After that, we got the cave. This is a staple in computer graphics uh, and specifically AR, VR. Most um, research labs have something like that. Uh, and this thing is actually projection AR. So this is two projectors projecting different images on the, um, on the wall. And what we have here is the, the environment, the projectors themselves are actually tracking the user's head and moving the environment, moving the projection based on how you move. So you don't even have to actually wear any smart glasses or smart devices because you're actually being tracked and your world moves in order to create that depth of 3D. Amazing, amazing research that comes up every time someone talks about augmented and virtual reality and most research lab and, and Columbia as well have some kind of um, cave uh, on premise. Um, after that, 
Again, sticking to gaming, Sega tried to do this VR headset that you will probably game with. Another commercial failure. No one actually used it. They only were able to sell it in some, of, uh, some arcades. And Virtual Boy. Some of you will probably know this. Um, Nintendo tried to do VR. It went really bad. It was only black and red. Um, there was no real feel of immersion. And again, it wasn't using your hand. You had a controller um, that you had to use. Uh, but again, a really cool uh, way to start things off, to basically introduce commercial-ready and consumer-ready VR. Finally, we jump into the 2000s. Finally, this millennia. Um, only in, 20, in, um, in, uh, 20, in 2005, we had mobile AR for the first time. A research paper showing how you can put your phone, scan some QR code, and basically you'll be able to play tennis uh, with a multiplayer game. And this was an insane research. If you think about when we started this out, I just showed you, oh, just scan this QR code, you're gonna see that first state, and there you go, it works. Um, that was like 15 years ago, that was still a research phase, kind of maybe we can even make it work. And now everyone has that on their phone automatically. How insane is that? Oculus Rift was introduced in 20, uh, 2012. Um, this was an insane advancement. This is the first consumer ready um, VR headset that people can buy and use. Um, the company was bought automatically uh, by Facebook uh, to extend the social aspect of Facebook into VR. And now they're working on really exciting projects when it comes to virtual reality. Um, and we're going to talk about later when we talk about specific headsets um, about the type. But this was the first consumer ready VR. And again, it wasn't that long ago, like eight years ago. We have the Google Glass, we're now infamous Google Glass, um, that tried to introduce AR um, into the popular culture. You basically had this monoscopic view, so like just one eye, and you got um, heads up display like in games, so you get like the, what's the time or some weather and stuff like that. Uh, that was again, a really cool use case, but failed one, because it's not true 3D, right? You don't project data to both eyes, just to one, so you're not getting that sense of depth. Uh, but also there was a ready. Like it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't what everyone hoped AR would be. After that, we got the Google Cardboard. This was, and I'm not even joking, this was one of the most amazing advancements in AR VR, and it's actually just a cardboard. Um, that gave people, and there's so many schools right now who are using the Google Cardboard um, with students who want to play around with AR VR. This is like a, just a small contraction with cardboard and two lenses. They can stick your phone in, and there you go. You're ready to teleport yourself in. Um, you can buy these things on eBay or Amazon for like literally three bucks or six bucks, um, and you get in full immersion experience with your phone that already has these features. Uh, if you go to YouTube, the YouTube app on your phone right now, there's always like this small icon on the, on the left or in the settings. Things, they can just switch to VR and see that video in VR, and it's pretty remarkable. 2015, we got the uh, Samsung Gear. There was like Samsung uh, attempt into uh, creating mobile VR. Um, it failed because people did not want mobile VR. They want to use their phone to power the experience, but rather a standalone headset. And that's the trend that we're seeing so far. After that, 2016. That was the most transformative year for me personally. Uh, this is me standing in the Microsoft store on Fifth Avenue, um, trying for the first time the HTC Vive, which was HTC's high-end vir virtual reality headset. That day, that was September 4th, um, 2016, changed my life. I, I tried this on, I was fully teleported to a new world, I was able to draw things in the virtual reality, and that was the day that I decided that I'm going into AR VR. I literally um, signed up to Columbia, went through the office of Stephen Feiner at uh, the Sexter building from the computer science department, told him, I'm getting, I'm, I, I want this. I, I need to be a part of this. I need to build this. Um, I want to do my thesis with you. And that was later what actually happened. Uh, but again, like I really recommend that everyone go when you can, obviously go to the Microsoft store, go get your hands on one of these headsets. Cause like the effect is unbelievable. It's like literally like, like seeing a black swan. It's unbelievable. It's like if you would see a unicorn rocking around. It, it's so transformative. The, the feeling is so magical that you're fully immersed in a completely different world. And when you take the headset off, you feel that, oh my God, I'm exiting the metrics. It's like so unbelievable. Right after that, we had, again, diving deep into the VR space uh, with gaming. PlayStation introduced the most successful VR headset uh, um, for gaming, which is the PlayStation VR and a few other cool games with cool brands. Amazing use cases, but it's not standalone. It has to use your PlayStation to power that experience. 
in, in 2016, we also got um, the Microsoft HoloLens. This is the Cadillac of augmented reality. Basically a headset that allows you to put it on. This is what we use that, that Columbia Medical Project that I showed you in the beginning. This is what we use to basically allow physicians to look inside the patient. It, uh, it, it's a self-contained headset. The entire computer is on your head and it's super lightweight and you're able to literally see things that are not there. The field of view is pretty decent. You're able to use your hands as controllers, your voice, um, your, your head is being tracked. It's an unbelievable machine in such a small standalone uh, form factor. 2017 is where mobile AR came to be. The reason that you're all able to play Pokemon Go today is because in 2017, Google and Apple introduced AR into everyone's phone. Everyone's camera now is a smart camera. It can understand your environment and understand where, what is the floor, what's a building, what's a table, and overlay that content. What I showed you earlier that I'm able to put like the Empire State on the floor, that's because my camera can recognize a surface. The reason that we're able to put um, Mr. Brightside on the QR code is because your camera can recognize that QR code and overlay that with data. Uh, in 2017, which again, only three years ago, was the year the mobile uh, AR came to be. 2018, we get the Magic Leap, uh, really cool headset, trying to be consumer ready, creating the next iPhone. Um, they are having a rough patch because um, they released their like they released their product two years after the Hollands, and it wasn't as good as the Hollands. Like the Hollands, which was like two years old by this point, was actually better in every factor. Focals is a really cool company that was just acquired by Google. So think about it. Two years ago, they created this AR headset, and two years after, Google buys them out. Um, Unbelievable entrepreneurial story. Uh, again, having some monoscopic display. So again, it's just one eye, but it gives you this heads up display. Like what time is it? Where's my Uber? Uh, and you're able to get some contextual information. And here, when it comes to interaction, we're actually controlling it with a ring. Um, so you have this cool ring that you can use as a controller. Everything that I told you so far, you can buy today, okay? Everything is consumer ready. So take that in consideration. Most of the things are pretty, pretty um, cheap, right? Relatively cheap, I guess. Moving forward, um, this was a really cool, um, and still is a really cool AR headset that basically allows cyclists um, to, to use augmented reality to get uh, travel information. Again, unbelievable use case, and we'll talk about use cases later, uh, but this is a, really like a extreme kind of um, cyclist ready AR. After that, we got the Oculus Go, a first standalone um, VR headset. Uh, had its limitations though, um, you had to use a controller. It wasn't actually um, completely, um, it has every degrees of freedom, like you can't walk around with it really. Um, but that was a really good precursor to what's gonna happen next. And right after that, I got more enterprise ready headsets. For example, AR in the industry became like a really good thing. People are using it in, um, in industrials and uh, use cases and factories to basically get more information and train, um, and train um, workers through remote assistance. Uh, and now we're also talking about um, longer battery life. It's 2019 already. If you can power your phone, you can power it in your headset. This is another cool example. And you can see right here, the field of view that I've been talking about. This is like basically when you're looking through the camera, when you're looking sorry, through the glasses, you're able to see this like small square of information. But it's really, really powerful because again, it's a standalone headset that now starts to look like an actual smart glasses that people could wear, uh, and it's all self-contained. 2019, which was last year, was a transformative uh, year for VR. Uh, this is Oculus Quest. I have one here, and once we all go back to the Columbia Startup Lab, I promise to bring it with me so people could play around with it in a safe environment um, and sanitize. Uh, but basically, it's an unbelievable machine. Standalone VR, you're fully transported to magical world, uh, takes over your, your sight, your, uh, everything you're hearing is through the headset. It tracks your hands. You don't even have to have controllers. Um, and it's super cheap. It's like 400 bucks, which is less than um, a console if you buy a PlayStation or an Xbox. An unbelievable machine, um, a big, big fan. And again, um, every time when it comes like uh, Black Friday or some, um, or like the holiday season, these things are sold out completely. Bakke's Strift was another high-end version of the Quest. This one is tethered to a computer, so you have to have a cord, uh, but the graphics are much, uh, are much better. Uh, but again, if you want a VR headset, go with the Quest, because you, you just put it on and it works, and you can walk around, and you don't need to con um, connect yourself to anything. Vario is another cool headset that was released uh, last year that basically 
has both AR and VR through camera see-through. So you're able to teleport yourself from VR to AR with the camera and then basically just switch between the two, either a fully virtual world or a mixed virtual world. Google Glass in 2020 this year tried to reintroduce the Google Glass, um, their failed attempt of enterprise um, glasses, but now again, the form factor is much better. Right after that, again, going back to the cardboard, the most successful things apparently are cardboard. Nintendo released um, these really cool attachments for the Nintendo Switch that basically add more interactions and VR with, again, just a small uh, paper contraption. The HTC Vive Cosmos, another high-end, unbelievable machine that allows you to teleport yourself to a new world uh, with real-life looking uh, graphics. It's really unbelievable. Pico Neo is something I actually tried myself uh, at CES in January when traveling was a thing. I flew out to Las Vegas to test this out. Um, this was an amazing machine. Again, wireless, 4K resolution to each eye. It was really, really unbelievable to see that, again, we have come, remember, we started out um, in the um, 1836, and now, 2020, we have full-on 4K graphics being um, projected into each of your eyeballs. It's, like, unbelievable. Like, the, the, the amount of time that um, we have here when it comes to that journey is super short. Unreal is a really cool, it's a Chinese company. This is yours truly wearing it at Las Vegas. Uh, wireless. Look, look at the form factor. This looks like just sunglasses. It looks really good. It is tethered though, um, but it basically gives you AR in the capacity that this is something that people would wear. Like now we're at the point that this is consumer ready. Um, so definitely check them out as well. They're shipping as we speak. And Microsoft Hollis, what I call the Cadillac of AR. Uh, now even um, they upped themselves and created this new headset, which is much better. Now has um, both hand tracking, eye tracking, like it literally tracks your eyeballs to figure out where you're looking. So more interaction, more tech in this small, small device that just sits on your hand very comfortably. And as you saw in the beginning, a physician was able to do an entire surgery with this thing on their head. So no problem at all. So we talked about the history. We talked about devices. We talked about how uh, AR and VR are different. And now I want to dive into a little bit about use cases and how you can use these technologies, how you can use those devices if it's through your mobile phone or if it's through a custom headset that you can buy. So we touched a little bit about surgery, right? We talked about uh, healthcare, but there's other uh, amazing use cases like interior design. So IKEA has a school app that you can Try before you buy. See if the uh, if the sofa matches the lamp. Uh, swap out, mat, swap these out. This is another example in retail where a boy could put a Lego um, a, a Lego box in front of a camera, and it automatically shows them how that um, that Lego set will be look uh, will look like after they've built it. Um, games obviously is a big thing. Advertising, tourists. These are all amazing use cases that we're gonna dive into in a sec. So perfect. So this was a really cool precursor to that. Let's talk about use cases and what you can do with augmented virtual reality. So let's start with the use cases. When people talk about augmented reality, they have this almost like uh, black mirror kind of vision that everything will be like this hyper reality filled with 3D all around them. That will probably not be the case, even though I do not object. Uh, but we're going to start simple and see how these technologies are able to integrate into people's lives. Starting app easy, AR gaming, we have things like Pokemon Go. Most of you probably played with that. VR gaming, as we mentioned, Beat Saber. This is one of the most popular games right now that people are just playing around with. Uh, and it's really a really fun game and uh, keeps, you, keeps you healthy and fit because you're able to basically run around. Retail and shopping, as we just talked about, uh, with basically using um, computer vision, recognizing the same way we recognized earlier with the QR code, now we're recognizing this box and we're able to overlay content uh, on top of that. Art is another big one. In this example, we have art coming to life through augmented reality. Even our company, we supported a really cool art project at the um, at the Governor's Island. They, there's a hollow center there uh, that basically shows a lot of holograms, and we're fortunate enough to support a really cool art project there that people will basically teleport themselves under the sea. VR is amazing, as I mentioned. That this was the thing that made me a believer when I tried that on for the first time able to basically create amazing things in virtual reality. This is another cool example of the New Yorker basically bringing their newspaper to life. You put your phone or tablet in front of, um, the, in front of the, the paper, it recognizes it immediately and overlays that with some video that looks like it's coming to life. And it's unbelievable you can do the same thing with art as we saw earlier.
Construction is obviously a big thing. Recognize some floor plan, show us how the building would look like after. Change things in, in real time. Edit construction, basically collaborative, um, collaborative uh, work around construction can be done with augmented reality. Zoology, obviously, uh, I don't know who would like here to, di to dissect frogs, but this is obviously much uh, easier and more humane. You're able to basically learn about um, different species through um, augmented reality that are not actually there. Anatomy is a big thing. Obviously, if you want to study animals, you want to study ourselves, um, we can basically see how the patient's anatomy is in real time, learn about it. Um, and this is, again, these are like the, the, these apps exist and they're free and a lot of them you can just download to your phone right now. Tourism is obviously a big thing. When Pokemon Go was all the rage and people were running around, why not tell them where to run, to run around? Create that coverage of hunt and augmented reality and basically overlay the world with digital content. Um, this is, remember, we talked about the cave earlier on, basically faking some projection that basically shows you how you can um, use projection to uh, change your perspective. Same thing here. Now we're uh, teleported to, um, to Italy, I think, in this example, and you're basically feeling like you're there and you can fly around. Ads, as we mentioned, is the big thing. You can localize different ads based on, um, on um, location. So here we have the same commercial, either in the Philippines or in the US, basically streaming different content um, to your camera based on your location. Pretty cool. Filmmaking is a huge use case. Uh, if you've watched The Mandalorian, or um, The Lion King, both Disney properties, um, you've seen how they're using virtual reality to basically film the entire movie. You don't even have a camera anymore. Lion King was all CGI, and literally uh, the director, John Favreau, will use a VR headset to move around as the camera and capture that movement uh, as if it's the camera itself. Here we have complete motion tracking to basically simulate um, in real time the entire movie scene that you wanna build. Um, so again, really, really cool use case for virtual reality, basically giving um, creatives the way to build everything instantly. Remote assistance is obviously a big thing, and we talked about that earlier. They're able to have a expert projecting data to um, a novice or someone who's learning to basically um, change things um, or fix a problem. Remote work is a big thing. This is a New York-based company called Spatial uh, that now actually um, made their product free because of COVID and everything. Um, you can basically teleport yourself and work with people uh, through virtual avatars and basically share a lot of um, presentations and documents in augmented reality, either through your phone or a headset or a, uh, even if it's AR or VR. So definitely check them out and support their fellow uh, company here in New York. VR training is a big thing, um, specifically here, because again, VR is something that you can simulate in a complete environment. But what's interesting here is like, see how the headset itself actually um, understands where the user's hands are seamlessly. Again, talking about hand tracking and user-computer interaction, um, this is what we're talking about. The, the headset is so good that it can actually recognize your hands. Marketing is obviously a big thing. I want to buy Dr. Pepper now because I see this amazing magical can. This is a comical example of, of VR in which we're basically, again, pushing the limits of, of interaction with the computer, and now we have this simulator of, of flying. Pretty comical, but cool. I'm sure that the person right here feels fully immersed and feels like they're flying. Ski, obviously, again, gamifying the experience, gamifying um, the way you can interact with a mundane sport at this point. Um, same thing with exercise. You feel like you're actually pedaling, but you're actually you know, driving a race car. Very cool use case of, of virtual reality. Again, teleporting you to a different reality completely. Navigation is a big thing. I went to Boston and I had no idea where I am. I open up Google Maps and you can do it too as well. Google Maps already has AR integrated into it, which means you'll open your map and it will tell you literally step-by-step step where to go and how to go. And it will use uh, all the technology and all the data they aggregated from Google uh, Street View that basically you know, took pictures of the entire world, um, now, now we see why, because we're able to inject AR into that. We're able to understand and recognize environments through those scans, and now we're able to overlay the world with data like, oh, turn left here, turn right there. Uh, it's a lifesaver, and definitely, definitely check it out, because again, most of your phones on your Google Maps app already have that. Moving on to spatial mapping again, this is a really cool way a lot of people are trying to create a digital copy of the world the same way Google did with Google Street View. Uh, and then we're able to inject 3D content to that digital content, to that digital twin of the world, basically. 
spatial AR is a big thing that you most of, probably know about. If it's face filters, if it's through Snapchat or, or Instagram, uh, TikTok, it's already a part of every Gen Z's life, integrating um, content in the world that is not actually there. Uh, social VR is a thing. There's a group of VR um, investors in the Valley that always um, meet up for poker games um, in, in VR. So that's pretty cool. Air portal is another cool use case for augmented reality. Basically, again, teleporting you in AR to a different world. Here we have, you're basically able to walk into an art piece through this magical portal, through this magical door. Measurement is a classic example. If you don't have a ruler, you can use your camera. Um, because cameras are so sophisticated right now, it's so smart, um, you can download any app, just Google the uh, App Store or, the, or Google Play for AR measurement. You're going to get a cool app that basically allows you to measure anything with your camera. AR surgery, again, we talked about that. This is the uh, example that we did with Columbia. J taking 3D assets, putting them into your head, and basically now the doctor is getting an amazing experience, an amazing way to understand the patient's anatomy um, that he didn't have before. Training, uh, again, is a good thing, specifically uh, for medical as well. Um, translation is another cool thing that you, everyone already has on their phone. Just use Google Translate. If you're traveling, put your phone in front of a, a street sign, it will automatically translate that in augmented reality. Check that out, you already have that on your phones. Um, Poe was asking, do, um, do you have to have glass for maps? No, if you, if you have just your phone, just use your phone with Google Maps and you're good to go, just the Google Maps app. Same thing with the Google Translate app. It's already integrated in there. Home design, we talked about the IKEA example that you can try before you buy kind of thing and see uh, how things are looking in real space. For example, here we have a couch being shown. This is a really sad story. This is a mom interacting with her dead daughter in virtual reality. Pretty creepy, but if, again, if it's for her, it, it brings closure, why not? And in a pretty extreme case of virtual reality, but again, going into that immersion and simulation. Air Copy Paste was a recent cool project. People literally took things from the real world, put them in the presentation, grabbed things from the real world, and put them in virtual, in virtual spaces. Multiplayer is another thing that we talked about, gamifying. You're, we're both able to play around, for example, basketball right here um, with people around us, but nothing is actually there. Visualizing a menu, super classic uh, use case of augmented reality is there's a New York based company who does that. Um, they basically capture um, these 3D models and you're able to see uh, lifelike representations of food. Now let's talk a little bit about more about human computer interaction. We talk about hand tracking, how you can basically use your hands as um, a form of input. Um, let's take that into the next level. This is a really cool example in augmented reality, how you can have floating menus around you and you're using your hands to control them. This is magic and this magic exists. Um, that's the cool thing about augmented virtual reality that all these sci-fi things are not sci-fi at all. Like they're not fiction. Uh, they actually exist and you can play around with them. And here again, th these are a lot of the things that come up when futurists or just people like you and me talking about um, how we'll design the next generation of computing. Because if you think about it again, you know how to use a mouse and a keyboard, but what's the equivalent in 3D? Is it using your hands? Is it using your voice? These are questions that need to be asked through research. This is another cool example of human computer interaction, in which the controller is actually a mock-up wheelchair, giving you that sense of like, how is it like to be in a wheelchair? Uh, really interesting research and really interesting way to, again, have a non-obvious way of input which is a wheelchair being like your keyboard. Okay, so we talked a lot about uh, augmented virtual reality. We talked about um, the history. We talked about uh, what's the differences between the two, and we saw so many use cases. Now, when we talk about pop culture, like movies and games, we see that augmented reality is actually in there for so long. All these amazing emerging technologies have been um, instrumental to how we perceive um, pop culture. So all these movies, for example, have some kind of form of AR or VR. Um, specifically, the Iron Man suit, obviously. Um, Minority Report with Tom Cruise, this is actually a, a, a scene that's being studied at um, one of the computer interaction um, classes at Columbia. Because this is, again, like, an like suddenly you're interacting with a computer with your hands or with your voice, or you have this heads up display. When it talks to games, obviously every game is super, super saturated. Um, 
every game has some AR overlay. This is a, such a classic staple of what we're used to. Oh, let's get more information by projecting data on, uh, ex on animals around us, for example. This is a cool game called Zero Horizon Dawn um, and um, basically uses AR to get more information on the, on the environment. Uh, same thing here, Detroit being human. You're a detective trying to solve a crime. There you go, you have AR to help you. Um, world greatest detective talking about detectives the batman game also has ar vr integrated into it because again like for us as as humans spatial computing in a sense is very native to us like it's really it it doesn't shock everyone that we want data being shown around us and this is a classic example of that that is already again implemented in movies and games these are a few examples of games that you can download right now um, and play around in AR and VR. Pokemon Go, obviously. Ingress is another. Um, there's Catan World coming up soon. Wizarding World, you're able to run around and fight um, like some, some monsters and play around in uh, your Hogwarts house because it's basically a Harry Potter game. I play Jenga in augmented reality. It will put blocks on your table and you can just flip them over. Um, basically, I would really recommend playing around because, again, most of the devices already have these technologies integrated into them. Okay, so we talked about augmented reality, we talked about virtual reality, and we understand that the difference between the two technologies, even though they're really similar, is immersion or like the simulation that VR gives you, as opposed to what AR has is the utility. You're able to empower doctors or have remote assistants and stuff like that. Both are valid, different approaches, different use cases, but very, very powerful mediums. Now we're talking about 3D and this new type of content that's being emerging. And take these, um, these things in mind next time that you want to build something. Now um, we have um, a few more minutes. I'm gonna talk about um, things that are, again, seems really science fiction, but they're actually just science and they already exist, but they're super futuristic and super amazing. Um, Facebook, for example, has this array of cameras that would scan your entire body and give you a 3D avatar of yourself, fully lifelike avatar that can move your tongue, move your eyes, and everything looks exactly like you. It's unbelievable. It's uncanny even. And again, transitioning from this kind of 3D avatar to this is unbelievable. It's already there. Like you, as long as you have this insane array of cameras. Uh, jumping to Omnitrax, uh, you can buy one of those. Um, Ready Player One kind of thing, walk around virtual reality um, and basically get a full world that you can explore just by walking. Uh, there's different approaches to that. This is an infinite deck. Basically, you can see that these, uh, this treadmill basically moves around to every direction that you're stepping. But you can also have other approaches like what Cat is doing right here is that basically you're uh, standing on this kind of aluminum um, board and basically you're able to uh, move around to any direction. Um, Omni is doing the same thing with a plastic board. These things are already there. Like you can actually buy these things. Some arcades already have that. And in New York, um, there's an, uh, an arc, the AR VR arcade called Jump Into the Light that has most of these things. Um, this is another example from an Omni track. Now we just have this uh, plastic um, um, board that you can walk across. Again, different approaches to the same um, omnidirectional track. Haptic gloves are really cool. This is actually something you can wear and you will feel that you're holding something. They will either vibrate or, um, or create some sense of, of heat um, and that will allow the, the, the environment to basically change based on how you're using your hands. So it's not only hand tracking, but also giving you some haptic feedback on what you're holding, how you're feeling, fully immersing you in this uh, environment because you're actually feeling stuff that are not actually there. Um, so if we have gloves, we obviously have suits. This is an amazing example, very laser taggy, um, that you can basically play around with a full suit that will vibrate and make you feel like you are in the game, like you're in the, in the, uh, in the environment. Um, this is a cool suit I saw at CS in Las Vegas called the Tesla suit, not related to Tesla, but good name. Uh, the basically looks pretty good, right? Like this is, it looks pretty futuristic, but you can just buy it, it's already there. Um, but it does have a really cool form, form factor that people could consider buying. The way it works is, again, it gives you some uh, electric jolts every time someone like hits you or touches you, and it basically moves you around and it gives you that, again, that haptic feedback from the environment that is not actually there. Um, couple that with a VR headset and you're fully transformed and like it's fully teleported into the matrix. This is another really cool technology called touchless haptics. Uh, this is an array of microphones, ultrasonic microphones, I'm sorry, speakers, um, ultrasonic speakers that will 
basically uh, create this wave of sound, ultrasonic sound that you don't actually hear, but you feel it. I tried this baby out, um, what was it, last year? It's unbelievable. You, when you put your hand on top of that, you feel that your hands are burning or that they're very cold or that they're being electrified. Uh, here you can see how this hand is actually moving a virtual hand just by moving your hands on top of these small, small speakers that project sound on top of that. Um, this is an unbelievable um, innovative use case and how you can apply ultrasonic sound to human computer interaction and computer science. Well, we talk about computer, about computer science and all these advancements, so why not use the same sound to actually levitate stuff, right? So if you think about it, a pixel is a 2D representation. We have a screen and we have all these pixels. But in 3D, what is a pixel? So a, a pixel in 3D is called a voxel. And here we have a voxel. This is literally a point that is being levitated using ultrasound. Uh, if we have mo uh, multiple points, it's a line. If we have multiple lines, it could be a drawing. I saw amazing research of people trying to create this basically real world construct of a dog running around you with these floating dots that basically can create a real world structure um, through virtual um, environments. And basically you just code these uh, speakers to emit the right kind of ultrasonic sound and pattern. Perfect, I hope that all these things that we talked about so far really blew your mind. Um, these are so many things that again, we've talked about the past, present and future, but the future is just us being limited by our imagination. See all these amazing technologies that you can build your next venture on or your next startup idea with, or even add them to your existing startup. We saw so many amazing use cases um, of augmented virtual reality that in a sense, can be integrated everywhere. We talk about sports and shopping and, and, and retail and games uh, and healthcare and, and even visualizing food. So there's so many things that you can build. And now again, you're just limited to your imagination. And hopefully everything we talked about um, today will help um, your imagination run wild. So if you want, uh, feel free to register to our service as well um, and build all these things. Um, you can register for free on our website and I'd be happy if you want, email me that you uh, saw this talk and we'll be happy to extend um, some free credits to our service as well. Uh, but everything we just saw is something you can build. You can build today and you can use our service to do so. Thank you so much for being on this workshop. Uh, hopefully, again, you've learned a lot um, about augmented reality, about virtual reality, about the past, future, and present of these technologies and what you can build. Get your hands on a VR headset or an air glasses, because again, the, the feeling is just magical uh, that you're fully transported in this new world. I want to thank again the Colombian Entrepreneurship and the Columbia Startup Lab for inviting me. Uh, hopefully you all learned a lot about this. Thank you so much, Alon. I, I literally was Chris Pratt. And when that <laughs> slide came up, I was like, okay, there it is. <laughs> that was mind blowing. Amazing. I learned so much. All right. I think that just about sums it up. Um, thank you again so much for your thank time. You. This was phenomenal. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks everyone. Thank you.